Um, thank you everyone for tuning in today to join us for this sports PR event. So I'm Eleanor and I'm the chair of the Next Gen Yorkshire PRCA committee and we're joined today with the person we'll be putting all your questions to, Vic Tidmarsh, who's head of digital at Hatch, who are also a sports specialist PR agency. Uh, so thank you Vic for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited so, to go through the questions. We've had a lot of questions in, which is great, covering a wide sort of range of things within sports PR. So we're going to kick them off um, with getting just a bit of background from you. So this is from Angela, and they've asked, have you always worked in sports PR? And tell me what attracted you to work with sports brands specifically. <clears throat> OK, so no, I haven't always worked in sports PR. Um, I guess officially I've only worked in sport PR for the last kind of three years during my time at Hatch. Um, but I have always been involved in sport in one way or another. So whether that's through kind of playing when I was younger or um, I had a blog, I have a Twitter account dedicated to football. Um, yeah, I've always kind of been involved in sport in one way or another. Um, and then I, I actually did journalism at uni, but I specialised in different modules in sports journalism. Um, so that kind of gave me an initial taste of uh, what to expect from the industry to an extent. Um, and did some work experience on sports desks during uni. So I kind of got that feel for it then and, and knew that it was something that I wanted to do. Um, but yeah, I'm hugely passionate about sports. I kind of always knew that I wanted to work in it in, in some form or another. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how I got into it. But I guess I got lucky really with Hatch because there's not that many agencies outside of London that, that specialise in sport, particularly with the sponsorship side of things. Um, so it's kind of an opportunity I couldn't turn down when they came knocking. So it looks like it was kind of all leading up to this, like always kind of hints within sports and you've managed to like marry the two. Um, and it's yeah. interesting to hear you say that you studied journalism at university because the next question we've had is um, what advice do you have for anyone wanting to work within PR in general? And do you have to have studied it at uni? Because I think a lot of people think that if you don't have a degree in marketing or press, then yeah. there's no point trying. Um, I definitely don't think that, that you need to have a degree in PR. In fact, I actually don't think you necessarily need to go to university to get into PR. Um, I think, you know, there are plenty of agencies that do have that uh, criteria, shall we say, but it's absolutely not a necessity. Um, I think anyone that has done PR at uni will probably say once you do get into the job, it is quite different doing it in practice to what you learn uh, in your seminars and stuff. So. Look, I've worked with people throughout my career of, that haven't done PR or anything even related to marketing and they've ended up in PR. That, that seems to be a bit of a theme, everyone just kind of ends up there. Um, but it's just generally having good communication, good writing skills is, is a good base to get into PR. Sports PR in general, I'd suggest that it's worth doing a bit of work experience on sports desks or you know, having a blog and having that passion for it um, definitely gives you a bit of an insight into what kind of content people want to engage with and I think there's kind of no doubt in that you yourself are sports mad even like looking at your <laughs> background um, but we've had a question from Jackie who's a freelancer and they want to know if do you have to be sporty yourself to be impactful within sports PR um I wouldn't say sporty in terms of physically being sporty but I think you definitely have an advantage if you are a fan or if you're interested in a particular sport um, it's, it's similar to kind of working in any sector in that you have to put yourself in the mindset of the audience and with sport the audience tends to be fans so it's kind of that extra level where fans aren't just consumers they're incredibly passionate about you know whether it's their team or their sport in particular um, they're also very very cynical you know people don't like to you know, like brands to kind of pretend that they are also fans, that they love their club as much as the fans do. So it, it kind of is about finding that balance between the two. Everything you do has to feel really authentic, otherwise you, you will get called out on it. Um, I think potentially with some sectors, you can kind of blag it a little bit, even if you're not hugely passionate, you can learn quite quickly or, you know, you've got things like lifestyle, which can be relevant you can kind of blag it a little bit with sport you just don't get that chance um so yeah definitely if you are a fan or have an interest in sport it's definitely going to give you an advantage yeah and I think it's the fact that fans 
normally know know more about the team than the the players themselves at some points. They're they're the true diehards that have been through it all. So they do see through things. But it's interesting that you've said that it's not, you don't necessarily have to be playing it yourself, but it does help if you have the passion and kind of the knowledge around it. Um, And I think sports PR is obviously something that will have taken a big hit during the pandemic um especially with like event activations and just lack of fans and things like that so we've had a question in from Stu and Stu wants to know what challenges if any did you face during the pandemic in landing media coverage and how did you handle them (laughs) yes there were definitely challenges (laughs) um challenges in general PR but sport PR in particular obviously for a period of time life sport was cancelled um, so we didn't actually have any events and then when the events and the matches and stuff did come back fans and spectators weren't allowed to attend but we still had tournaments that had tickets to sell we still had rights holders that wanted to see you know return on investment on these huge amounts of money that they put into being a partner or a sponsor of a club that we had to showcase what we could do for them so definitely tested our creativity I think we did okay though um, but yeah, I think when things did start to open up as well, we realised there was huge restrictions, even more than usual, around you know the access we could get to talent and the health and safety aspects that needed to be considered. Um, so it was a lot more planning, even more than usual. There's a lot of planning that has to go into sport care anyway, but this was just like a whole other level. Um, I think as well, it was a case of working with the, the teams that the in-house clubs have or the the sports and organisations themselves. good example is Leeds United. We do a lot of video content with them. Uh, And even now, we're not allowed physical access to the players. So we've worked really closely with them to make sure that our briefs and what we imagine the end content looking like are are really detailed. We're working with them to fully understand it so they can shoot it um, and we can then edit it into what we need. So there's been a lot of that. There's been a lot of virtual calls press conferences via Teams, lots of things like this where we've gathered questions in advance from journalists so that we can prepare our spokespeople or our talent for what's what's going to be asked of them. Um, So yeah, it definitely has been challenging. I actually think there's some aspects that we've learned and we've got used to during this few years, which will carry on. Um, Potentially streamline things, you know, a Zoom link up interview just has the same amount of impact as someone being sat on the sofa of a, a studio, so... I think a lot of that has actually been a positive in some way and helped us be a bit more efficient with what we can do. And I think it's also kind of decentralised it as well. Like you don't have to be getting everyone necessarily down to London studios and things like that. You Mm -hmm. can just jump on a quick Zoom call. Um, So you mentioned there about working with Leeds United, which is obviously a a huge um, (laughs) group to be associated with. Um, But Paul wants to know what has been the most memorable and successful campaign you've worked on? And then the alternative to that, if you're able to say, what do you think the most challenging campaign you've worked on is? I mean, maybe they both fall under the same thing. Um... I'm lucky enough that this is a difficult question to answer in picking the, my favourite campaign. Um, but it's probably the nationwide and FA piece that we've worked on this year. Um, so Nationwide Building Society are a partner of the FA Football Association um, and they work collaboratively on their mutual respect campaign. So it's all about encouraging respect on and off the pitch and obviously how we can better society as a whole by kind of maximising that relationship with the FA. Um, So what we have done is develop something called the coin for respect. We kind of looked into football, looked at those initial moments of respect and realised that the coin toss at the very beginning of the match is that first symbol of fair chance and respect to each other. You've got the captains that are shaking hands at the start of the match, uh, but no official coin has ever existed. So perfect opportunity for us to create one. So we've spent the best part of the last year kind of going through a process of working with kids to kids to design what this coin looks like, um, understanding what respect means to kids, because actually, you know, we were quite surprised by some of the responses and how much kids put into thinking about respect and, and how they can, you know, take it into football, but school and every other aspect of their life as well. So we've worked over the last few months in bringing that coin to life. Um, we've just gone through that launch period. It actually exists now. And so 15,000 of those coins are going to be sent to grassroots referees across the country and actually used within their matches. 
Um, and it's all just about having that symbol of respect, as I say, and kind of encouraging good behaviour through the rest of the match. So it's something where we've actually been able to enact behavioural change, which a lot of the time with PR can be quite tricky. Um, we can do really nice fluffy stuff, stuff that gets great headlines, but actually changing behaviours is not often something you get to do. So, yeah, that's definitely been a highlight for me. And naturally the most challenging is we've worked with England footballers and talent left, right and centre. It's been through COVID restrictions. Um, yeah, it's definitely been a challenging one. Yeah, I, and I, I agree on the, the challenge of kind of managing all the moving parts of it. But when you're seeing all over social media, people sharing it, the likes of David James, Jeff Frazier and all these people getting behind it, it shows that you've really done a good job with that. Um, <laughs> and, and I think moving kind of into more niche sport, so not just sport in general, we've had a question which wants to know kind of what are the main differences between sport focused media, i.e. kind of the rugby media or the football media? Do you have to pitch differently? Do they look for different stories or is it kind of a one size fits all? Um, comparing sports media or niche sport media to kind of just traditional, you know, lifestyle media and national contacts and stuff. Um, comparing like sports so like pitching to football okay. as opposed to pitching to rugby basketball yeah. etc um I think that's quite a simple one to answer in that football dominates British sport in particular so there's a lot more publications there's a lot more writers that focus on football um but on the flip side there's a lot more football related activity there's a lot more sponsors in football so it's really saturated um and it just means it's even more competitive for you to try and get your story covered so you really have to land it otherwise it's going to be a big waste of money essentially um whereas with the likes of rugby and cricket you have fewer contacts um they have less content to write about so we're often quite grateful as long as your activity is good um really it all comes down to making sure that you have those relationships with the journalists now our team in particular work on the rugby league world cup which should have taken place now um, but it's obviously been postponed to next year. And having those relationships with the journalists just means that when crises happen or when announcements need to be made or when you've just got PR stories that are going out, you have kind of just this book of people that you know are going to pay attention. They're going to give you a little bit of leeway with certain things if necessary. They can advise you on what's going to be a good story and how you should structure it. Um, so even more so than, you know, PR, it's always important you have these contacts, but particularly in sport, it's, it's absolutely vital to it being successful. Um, and I think leaning on them to, like I say, understand what actually is a story and what isn't, and what's going to resonate with their audience and what isn't can be really useful. So uh, I think really football is probably the trickiest just because there's so much going on. But across the board, I mean, yeah, just getting those contacts right is, is the first step. And I imagine everyone thinks that um, sports PR is one of the most glamorous things around. You're always at events, meeting all these celebs. Um, but in reality, it's probably a lot more admin than that. Um, <laughs> so we've had a question in that wants to know, how do you manage working with and briefing sporting talent for campaigns, ranging from interviews to activations to videos? What's the best way to kind of manage that and ensure they're briefed accordingly? You have to be incredibly organised, more organised than you would ever believe. Um, even when you do have dedicated access to talent, it's likely that it will only be for a short amount of time. So a good example is working with the England players for Nationwide. We have two hour slots with them, which might seem like quite a lot of time to get things done. But if you are planning on doing video content, photography, media interviews, that two hours soon vanishes. So it's really important that you've got particular slots of time for each of those activities and you really stick to your deadlines. Um, I think it's also really important to remember that it's not their day job. So some of them are more charismatic than others. Some of them have got more media experience than others. Um, footballers in particular do a lot of brand work. And I think sometimes they can turn up and almost not quite know what brand it is that they're working for this time. Um, so yeah, those briefs are really vital to making sure that you get what you want out of that experience. Um, briefs cover off everything from who the brand is, 
you know, if it's a national name, then fair enough. But lots of brands within sport, you know, aren't necessarily household names. It's important that they know who they are, what they do, what their values are, what the activity is about, what the key messages are. You know, if you want someone to say something in, in an interview, they need to know word for word what it is that that, that line is that you need. Um, everything down to what they wear. You know, if you've got England football and they turn up in Adidas trackies and trainers, that's a big no-go because England is sponsored by Nike. So it's really small things like that that you have to consider. Um, otherwise, you've got your black sticky tip coming out and covering up logos, which is never a good thing. Uh, another big thing, I think, is understanding the restrictions of what they are and aren't comfortable talking about. Um, in advance, particularly with footballers, they'll ask for questions from the journalists so they know what they're going to be asked and they can kind of think about what they'll answer. But journalists being journalists, they'll always try and push their look a little bit. They want that hook about, you know, what's going on behind the scenes. Do they like the manager? Are they worried they've not won for a few games? What's this scandal going on outside of football? They're always going to try and dig up that dirt or go off on a slight tangent. So we as PRs, it's our job to keep that conversation on track to cut in if the conversation is going in a direction that we're not comfortable with and essentially protect the talent but also make sure that the journalist gets the story that they need as well so spinning lots of plates and keeping lots of people happy it's our job really sounds like a lot of lists are required lots of, these lots kind of spreadsheets of <laughs> to make sure you're on top of it um you touched earlier about sponsorship um which i know something hatch does a lot of sponsorship activation and about how fans can be very quick to see if something maybe isn't quite right. Um, so we've had a question in that wants to know, how can you take a product or brand that sponsors a team and make the fans connect with it, especially if it isn't necessarily directly a sporting product? Yeah, I mean, this is really the crux of being good at um, activating sports sponsorships and, and not, um, you have to be creative. That's what it comes down to. But also, as I said before, really understanding what fans actually want to engage with. Um, just finding that balance between that aspect of what's going to be engaging, but also keeping what's important to your brand at heart. You know, it's not necessarily about having your brand logos plastered everywhere or whatever some brands may think it is. It's finding that topic of conversation that works for both parties. Um, we do it quite a lot. I mean, we work with High Sense for Leeds United, so it's about... Um, kind of including fridge freezers and washing machines and content, which isn't always the easiest thing to do, but there are definitely creative ways to do it. Um, and really the things that need to matter are, or the things that matter to fans anyway, is seeing or hearing from players. They want to know what's going on kind of behind the scenes. They want to see things that they wouldn't normally get access to. If you can do that, then you're on to a winner, regardless of what it is that you're trying to promote. Um, also values, I think across PR we've seen brands really need to start considering what matters to consumers. Um, and I don't just mean a you know, price point or a nice shiny product, but things like sustainability and mental health in particular have become really prominent in sport. Um, again, comes back to being authentic and not seeming like you're just involved in those conversations because you want to promote your brand, um, but you're actually giving something back to the fans as well. And finally, community particular in sport community is huge whether that's your actual physical community or the fan-based community how can we engage with them how can we get them directly um, how can we feel like we are supporting them and wanting to be a part of that community ourselves um, again an example with Leeds United this summer when when fans came back to the ground for the first time since the pandemic started we worked with their supporters trust to have a welcome back mural created, which naturally had some very subtle high sense branding in it. Um, but that kind of becomes overlooked because you're providing something positive for the fans to engage with. Um, and that's really just finding that balance is, is key. Yeah, and that mural obviously got a lot of pickup as well. Um, so it shows that it is possible to balance the fans and also getting the press angle in there as well. Um, so I think sometimes we forget that we're potentially a bit privileged working in an agency that does have so much sport um, and there's a lot of places that maybe don't have as much. And we've had a question in from Lucy who wants to know 
what is your advice for anyone wanting to move sideways into sports PR? It is easier said than done because, like I said, there's not that many agencies in particular outside of London that, that specialise in sport. Um, so it's a case of, I guess, trying to get as much freelance experience by yourself as you can whilst you're doing something else, unless you want to move to London. Um, there's plenty of in-house roles as well. So working in sports PR doesn't necessarily have to be an agency side thing. Um, but just go for it. Just, just absolutely go for it. If sport is something that you're passionate about, there's nothing better than working in sport PR because we get the best of everything. We're not just fixed on one team or one sport. We get a nice variety. Um, there are absolutely perks. Um, but don't get me wrong, it's, it is definitely hard work. Um, you know, I look back over the last year and I've been incredibly fortunate, especially given the circumstances, you know, everything going on in the world, that I've been able to experience some amazing events and spend time with elite sports people. Um, but be prepared that it's going to be hard work. You know, we've talked about all the admin, all the planning, all the health and safety. You know, we're protecting not just brands but individual sports people as well a lot of the time and their reputations so um yeah just be prepared for it to be hard work and definitely not to see this as a negative but you know there's that saying of you should never meet your heroes kind of works that way sometimes in sport as well that once you've seen how things work behind the scenes and you know just how much goes into keeping these clubs running every single day it's actually not as glamorous sometimes as it might seem so Perks are great, but it's definitely hard work. And I think that's a really kind of refreshingly honest look into <laughs> it because so many people just focus on the positives and not what you actually could be kind of getting yourself into. And I think that leads really nicely to our final question that we've had submitted. And they would like to know, what do you wish you personally knew before working within sports PR? So kind of a letter to your former self. <laughs> Um, I've kind of got a positive and a negative, not a negative as such, but just understanding quite how different it is to your, your regular PR, if you like, your FMCG, consumer goods kind of thing. Um, you know, I've PR'd everything from car finance to energy providers to pensions, all that glorious stuff, you name it, I've PR'd it. Um, and you do get into a bit of a rhythm because there is a bit of a template on on how PR works and actually when you get into the sports side of things it is a bit different you know you've got your weekends at peak times for doing sports activities you need to be prepared to be working around that um, you as I say aren't just protecting a brand per se you're also thinking about individual talent and personalities and their reputations balancing what a brand wants versus what talent wants versus what PRs wants and journalists, you know, it's lots of plates spinning that you have to try and bring together to create that successful story. So I guess my point is, I just wish I had been a little bit more prepared for almost how I would need to take a back step to teach myself how to be good at sport PR. But my second point, much more positive, is I wish I knew how much I would enjoy it because I would have pushed myself to find a route into sport PR sooner than I have done, um, rather than kind of just looking out, if you like, that Hatch had a, a position available when I was ready to move on. Um, yeah, I, I love my job. It's very hard sometimes, but it's so rewarding when it when it works out and you've got this, you know, activity that fans are engaging with because they're so difficult to get into most of the time. So when it works, it's incredibly rewarding and yeah, if I could go back, I would definitely get into it sooner. Thank you so much. That's really great to hear. And obviously the purpose of these kind of events is to make the industry more inclusive and diversify it. Um, and if there is anyone else watching that wants to get involved with that, um, Lee's details are going to be down in the description. So please do drop her an email. So we'd love to have you involved. And big thank you to Vic for sharing her time and her expertise on this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And if you want to hear more from Vic, um, you may have noticed that she's a bit of a Leeds fan. So you can tune into her Leeds United podcast and that's titled Right in the Gary Kellys. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Vic. It's been really useful and really helpful to hear from you today. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Thank you everyone for watching.